So, announcement number one. Da 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 da. Okay. What's that sound that you make when you find something in Zelda? Dun 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 dun. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna stop. All right. So, our next theme is now open. So if you guys want to have a specific theme, you just have to vote between the four that I've that I've uh, preset here. And I'll give you a week to vote. So the votes end on the 21st. You have only one week to decide. If you want your, you know, whatever this, the, there's still chances. I mean, it looks, it looks like the Titan's Graveyard is going to win. A lot of people have been asking about environments. But these other character design, the chemist, that sounds really cool. I would love to work on something like that. Prop design, items. You know, drawing some potions, drawing some guns, drawing some, you know, anything that might, you know, dress up your portfolio. All of these uh, challenges are meant to dress up your portfolio, by the way. <clears throat> Character design, the robot, cyborg, or mech. So um, you get to experiment with a lot of mechanical designs, and um, I think that's really cool. That's not something we've touched on a lot. But it uh, seems the environment is winning. <clears throat> Titan's Graveyard sounds really, really cool. Uh, basically, it can be like an alien planet. It can be anything. I'll give you the specific rules. After this is done, I will send out a resource pack that will be available on my website for all of you. And you'll be able to download it here in the community tab. Right now, the resource pack for the villain is up, but that's long been done. And, uh, and yeah, so cast your vote. Do not forget to vote if you want to do something new and different and you want to see different stuff posted on the community. People have just been doing 14 day challengers. 14 day challengers continue your thing, don't stop. Uh, but if you want to uh, try something different, something new under my tutelage, I'll be able to, to include that in our next uh, critique hour. So it would probably be Friday the 21st, the polls close Friday to Tuesday, I'll work on the resource pack. And then the 26th and the 28th will be the days that we uh, critique. And I might extend it to the 2nd and the 4th. But I don't want to accommodate to laziness, especially because of this Pokemon hype. I can't wait till it's done. God! Okay. Um, so I think it will be done. Because there was like that Fallout 4 madness. And then there was Overwatch madness. Now it's Pokemon. And it's just, oh God, you know. like what, When do we get stuff done? If there's a game for every three month period that just hogs our time. Anyway. Um... I might host the two days for the theme, whatever it ends up being, on the 2nd or the 4th or the 26th and the 28th. Uh, but you have to make sure you cast your vote, uh, participate, even if it's just for fun. Might mess around with some concepts. All of these are really, really imagination friendly that get the ball rolling. I'll be including lots of resources, lots of reference images, inspiration images uh, to help you through and help you complete the painting. All right, so you've done my duty and voted. <laughs> Yes, this is essentially Brexit. Is this Brexit? Yes, this is the vote for, for America. This is the vote to make sure that falafel stands are available for every 20-mile um, uh, radius across the states. Um, this really ensures that all children of all ages, people of all ages, have access to authentic Middle Eastern falafel. <laughs> <laughs> I would totally vote for something like that. I miss falafels so much. I haven't had a falafel in years. Um, anyway, uh, okay. So let's close this up. Don't forget to vote. Please don't forget to vote. If I see like 50 votes, I'm not doing a class. I have to see at least 100 votes because there's 100 of you plus that visit this stream uh, weekly. Other than last Tuesday. I don't know what happened last Tuesday. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I need to see that you guys are trying and you guys are, are ready to, you know, dragon, 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 dragon. Now, where is my... There it is. So not a lot of stuff is submitted lately that is in variety, which is why I kind of wanted to rush the community. Vote the poll as much as possible. Uh, just fair warning, I'm super short of breath today. My workout was unbelievable. And I kind of pushed myself too far, so I am losing my breath. Um, just letting you guys know, if I need to take like a panting break, I will probably take one. I'll probably take one right now. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk about form studies real quick. 
uh, form studies are really, really tricky, but they are also the most helpful thing you could do for yourself as a growing artist. Form studies have this power to remove the creative pressure from your process. They, they remove the, 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 the pressure to make something unique, some sort of unique thing, and leave, back, leave behind only the science. So let's say you had a big, a big vial, right? And in it, you had everything that is required to make a painting successful. So you need some creativity. So this is the mushy stuff. You need some inspiration. And this is the sparkly stuff. All right, so the creativity is the, like the content, the narrative, whatever it is. The sparkly stuff is just the also attached to the narrative, but it could be some sort of repetitive theme in your work. It doesn't really matter. You need a lot of sciences, just a, just a lot. Of, of science. You just need lots of science. All right, so that's iron. I don't know what other H. <laughs> All right, you need a lot of science, a lot of geometry, a lot of physics. You need a lot of that. <clears throat> you need a lot of like deep repressed inner darkness as well <laughs> to complete an image. Some sort of like years of, of pushing away possible lovers, some some kind of inner murder that you were a part of in order to inner Satan sacrifice something to help you achieve this current skill level but I don't know what masters do to get <laughs> as good as they are but there's just some sort of like blackness at the base of the vial right here just like some sort of black substance that is as black as night all right there's a bunch of other shit in here um, other artists that inspire you is kind of connected to that but there's a lot of shit that goes into a full painting if you were to formulate a painting into a vial through some sort of chemical, chemical whatever, reaction. Let's say we boiled all this out, and all that should be left behind if you're doing a form study is just the science. There is no more creative force left behind. As much as you'd like to argue there is some sort of narrative in you, this triangle represents my inner peace, and the, this triangle, <laughs> this rectangle represents the strive, you know, the, 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 the greater climb of humanity, and this one, this sphere represents the endless cycle of the human condition. I don't know, whatever it is. No. What's left behind is just the science, all right? So this is why when you boil all this shit out, all that should be left behind is is this the science right here when we take when we get rid of all this extra muck this little you know it's called muck I call it muck sludge something some some sort of swampy slowness that slows down the process of the create the creation process creativity all right it, it may speed up as a catalyst the creative process but creativity in my opinion slows down the creation process, the technicalities of the studies. Creativity slows down the student. All right? So everybody write that back to me. Creativity slows down the student. Why does it slow down the student? It slows down the student because it requires a lot of in, like, uh, it requires a lot of just thinking, uh, inward thinking, inward reflection. Um, some kind of narrative, some kind of creative stages and creative stages of the process, character design. It requires a lot of psychology. It requires a lot of study on the human self or whatever that person's role is in their story and the antagonist and the protagonist. And it always, this is why I say stay away from the masterpiece. Basically, I'm explaining why you should stop trying to create this masterpiece because what happens is we we wait for the next masterpiece before we experiment with sciences the sciences is what gets you to draw really really good you want to know what makes you draw really really good that's the sciences that's what makes you draw really really good uh, the stuff that makes you draw really really cool is the inspiration is the is the story is the background is that little pitch darkness that nasty little thing that we all have behind a, and the darkness behind all our paintings um, that is also uh, what makes a painting cool, but what makes a painting good is the light environment, the form, uh, the, the accuracy of the cast shadows, the, the, the values that you're choosing, the color choices, um, the proportions, the anatomy, the space, the depth, these are all scientific rules, these are all scientific phenomena. So <clears throat> what you have to do at one point in your life, all 88 of you watching at this time, you have to start including form studies in your cre in, in your creation process, in your study process, because it, right now this this balloon is shaded wrong. This value right here, these are this these are not chosen very accurately. This sphere is painted from one edge to the other as if a gradient. 
um, instead of coiling the brush strokes around the form of the sphere and reaching a radiation point from which all of these uh, graduations of the value emerge. <clears throat> all right, so these are things that you would have made a mis you would have carried this misinformation, this this pad technique of shading, which is a very flat. If you track down the grain, it's a very flat form of shading. You would have carried this into your next masterpiece. Why wait until the next masterpiece uh, to experiment with some sciences when you can do that here? So that said, I, I always want to encourage students as much as possible to attempt some form studies in their life. It's Paint some spheres, paint some cubes, paint some cylinders, all of those really pull from, you pull from those in order to render an arm. So let's say you are working on a masterpiece and you finally decided, okay, I'm going to finish a piece from start to finish and it's going to be great, it's going to be beautiful, I'm going to throw it in my portfolio and start getting paid. So you get to the arm of the painting and you just wonder how the hell you're going to do the arm. You don't have a good reference for it, you haven't found a good one, you think oh, I'm just going to freestyle it, let me see what I can do with just my visual library. All you have to do is call upon that last time you painted a cylinder and that would be the only thing you really need in order to be able to shade this arm. Yeah, it's got different grooves which is what the anatomy is there for, it tells you where the major bulges are of the muscle groups of the biceps, it tells you where the jagged edges are, the geometric um, edges of the elbow and then basic anatomy on tendons on the inside of the elbow all the way down to the wrist and then you get of course you have to get a reference for the hand unless you're some sort of genius but this arm always leads back to some sort of core geometry the thigh leads back to the sphere the head uh, part of the head leads to the sphere I mean not to the sphere the cylinder part of the head leads to the sphere um, uh, a lot of the head leads back to the cube so this is an off do off hours sandbox friendly environment, uh, no creativity way to study that is really really good for you and your perfection of your technique, your brushwork, and your basic lighting. Lighting is one massive thing about art that we don't have enough practice with. We all seem to just memorize one lighting on the face and we're good to go. There are so many different varieties of lighting that really construct a face very very beautifully. Uh, this is a reference that I generated um, yesterday uh, just to mess around with it. And there's all kinds of lighting that is available to you out there. This is done with Portrait Studio. And this is what makes for an amazing painting. You're trying different light sources, different kinds of combinations of light sources. <clears throat> and uh, I, I think that in order for us to really break these rules down, we have to break them down in their basic geometry. I would not be able to read this kind of reference. I wouldn't know what to do with it if I didn't have a value vocabulary in my mind. Uh, telling me how to go around, how to go about building a geometric object and changing it from a geometry into an organic image. There is a lot of the 3D world, okay, so why do I have to do this? Because these form studies have an aspect to them that we don't have unless we do them, which is the z-axis. These all are, are all three-dimensional objects and we use geometries to make it easier for us as the artists to generate organic three-dimensional objects and paint them and render them uh, because these objects, the, their base object, their most basic lowest common denominator shape is a geometry that we know in mathematics um, or sculpting or whatever, which is the cylinder, the cube, the pyramid. You can break down all kinds of shapes, um, organic objects, back into their geometric uh, origin. So that's it. That was my little blurb. I want you guys to remember that. Consider that. Try some cool combinations. If you don't have any cool combinations and you currently own Portrait Studio, we have a bunch of uh, different shapes available for you. We're going to have a wider variety later, uh, but all of these shapes are available for you. Here, 18 shapes, 20, 20 shapes, sorry. Um, uh, low, high, and medium polys for the face structure that will also help you generate um, geometries first instead of jumping straight into the high poly organics, uh, organic patterns of a face or whatever it is that you're trying to paint. But it all starts with being able to render a cube properly. So that said, let me jump into the paint over. So what do I want you to change about, God it's so hot here, what do I want you to change about this sphere? Um, so you had some great, great uh, fissures that you painted in, but I think what needs to happen is, let me just lasso that properly. Oh shit, okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not looking at the comment section. I will in a second. I just want to make sure that everything is tipped up. Add that. 
All right, so select inverse. So this sphere right here that you painted, you painted it in a straight kind of just, you just blended like this, you know, just went in straight lines. This is wrong. I don't think a sphere would ever, ever do this. I think a sphere has, has grains that move around it as a coil. So if anyone is ever curious about what the hell the coil technique is, this is pretty much it. You just coil around all, all the, or, uh, anything organic, and what happens is that coil kind of draws for you this line, this line, this line, this line, this one, this one, and this one. All of them draw for you the top, the contour lines on top. All you really need next are just some lo longitude lines, and you have, uh, you know, like a proper re uh, kind of representation of what, what happens on the surface of the sphere. These lines may look like just a bunch of hocus pocus geometry mathematics, that evil mathematics that no artist dares tread. Um, these may just look like freaky lines to you, but really what they are is a guide for your brush. What they tell you to do is curve your brush, man. I mean, you guys are always painting straight, you know, they're painting the cheek. Let's say you guys are painting the cheek of a face. Let me just get rid of all of that. Let me, like, just, uh, let me just draw something real quick. All right, so this is a face. You guys, when you paint the, the, the cheek of the face, sometimes you just do straight gradient, dark to light, dark to light, instead of shading radially. This is where you learn the pearl. I always talk about the pearl in the cave. This is the pearl. So this is where you learn how to shade radially, and not just radially, along a curve. So how would I fix this? Let me choose basic ass brush. I get this one, I guess. <clears throat> Lower my opacity down. And see this curve? This curve will, will anticipate the fact that there is some light and there is some shadow. And the light is wrapping around, the shadow is wrapping around still. And the highest point of the light might be on the z-axis. Might be, you know, it's not just at the end, it's just x and y. The, at this point we start thinking like a z-axis. <clears throat> so, what we're doing here is, again, remember those lines that I drew, those are, th these are the gradients. And considering where you place these shadows here, the light is coming at an angle. And the swell, the major swell gets the mid-tones, and only the edges get the shadow. So just by the diagram that I just drew for you, we just have this three-dimensional ass object. <laughs> And that's really how you learn, how, how you carry the knowledge of a geometry towards developing better, a better image of an organic, like an organic object, being able to draw a better organic object. See that gradient, that flatness that you guys are suffering from. And after you'll be able to build up cheekbones, chins, shoulders, will look more like shoulders if you learn how to paint radially, and I just showed you. Making sure that the, the light radiates from a point of impact between the light and the solid object and reflects back at you. It doesn't just sit there, it reflects back. And all these areas have different, like a sea urchin, they have different, they don't always share the same plane as the light source. So these areas will slowly uh, move back towards the, the shadow. It's not just a gradient, sometimes the shadow wraps around. Sometimes the mid-tone is at the edge, not the highlight. <clears throat> um, any questions? Geometry makes me cry. <laughs> uh, any questions at all? I mean, I'm not sure if there would be because I didn't really present anything new, but... <clears throat> um, Alright, so... Okay, all right, so try to focus on the lesson and not about how hot it is outside. <laughs> um, okay. <clears throat> all right, well, there doesn't seem to be any uh, art related chat. Uh, I'm not interested in that, Vinny. Think so. Um, how do you incorporate multiple references? Anything in relation to what I just discussed? Um, one second. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, totally unrelated, are you ever going to do a face reveal? I did reveal my face a couple of times in my streams. My private streams, um, not really my public streams, because these go straight up on YouTube. Uh, I don't really upload my face so much. <clears throat> All right, so everyone get back towards the uh, uh, topic at hand. What have I just, can anyone describe uh, what I've just shown you guys? What, 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 what's this principle, this technique that I just showed you? Sorry, YouTubers, people watching on YouTube. Uh, yeah, we do get sidetracked. <clears throat> Good question. Does rim lighting always appear on hard edges facing a light source? No. No. Uh, no. Rim lighting happens when you have a, dis a texture, a surface texture, or maybe a micro texture sitting at the very top of an object. Um, so right along here, what we might have is maybe like a hairy, a hairy, like a, some sort of fuzz or carpet. Let's say it's carpeted and we have tiny little hairs and these tiny little hairs are so translucent, well they behave translucent that the light, if it was coming behind the object in a state of a silhouette, uh, this this outer rim would be illuminated. There is no rim light that doesn't that is not that. that that's what rim light is. Everything else is just secondary light source reflecting on a surface, causing a terminator. Uh, so right here, this is what you guys might call something that you guys might call a rim light, but what it really is is just a secondary light source bouncing off a nearby surface or nearby light source creating this terminator line, this, this shadow, this clash between the two light sources. All right, so this is not rim light. Rim light is a very different kind of phenomenon, a light that travels on top of the hair, on, on top of the face, along a rim that the photographer strategically photographed. Um, it's not, rim light doesn't just happen on its own, depend, no, no matter where you're looking at it, it's rim light. No, rim light is just a, a perspective. Uh, and w a, a way to shoot the light, a perspective with which to shoot the light. <clears throat> radial shading spiral technique. Good, radial shading. Uh, it's a 3D, just a gradient won't do. Thank you, Justo Mimi. Um, radial shading, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, I have a face. If you guys ever catch my private streams, you will ca you'll probably see my face. Um, does an object cast a shadow if there is no light coming all around it, like an indoor scene with light coming through the window? Does the inside wall cast a shadow or is it just dark? Um, if uh, Wait, let me reread that. Does an object cast a shadow if there is no light coming all around it, like an indoor scene with light coming through a window? Does the inside wall cast a shadow or is it just dark? Of course it does. Everything casts a shadow. So, good question. I'm going to answer it because it's formulated. But if this is the room, and this is the wall, and this is the window, and it's very dim outside, lots of clouds, this light will still travel through. It will be interrupted by the four corners of the light source casting this kind of light. This light isn't, this is the cast shadow. This whole floor area is a cast shadow. This whole room is a cast shadow. And the only points of relief are the light that travels through. So if the light was blue, it's the light that travels through here. This whole room is a cast shadow. Does that answer your question? The wall, this is, this, this, this yeah, it reflects back. So it doesn't just sit there, it reflects back. So this wall might be just a little bit lighter near the bottoms. And this, these corners might be just a little bit darker over here. And this wall here would be just a little bit lighter than these. Or maybe these would be a lot lighter and these would be, and this would be just a little bit darker than the rest because this is the silhouetted, purely silhouetted window. It, 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 all kinds of combinations and all kinds of um, rays bouncing back and forth. But the whole room is a cast shadow technically cast shadow doesn't mean purely dark. It can be a, a grade of a shadow. <clears throat> okay. You're welcome. Uh, 
Rim light is like a circular light. A lot of beauty YouTubers use them. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by rim light. I think you're talking about the diffuse light, the light that removes a lot of those long cast shadows that hide some of the detail if you're doing a be like a makeup video. Yes, a lot of photographers use them as well because when you're photographing women, you really want softer shadows. Um, just because a lot of that shadow hides beauty, hides the you know the detail where the detail really happens. Although in my opinion, sharper shadows on women are absolutely beautiful. Um, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Vince. This is rim lighting. You see, we're we're, we're especially over here on the hair. Over here, this is, it's not really rim lighting because what's happening is the camera has deliberately moved itself behind the person, creating the rim uh, effect. But true, true rim lighting, which is subsurface scattering, happens when a light is either beside or behind an object traveling through this translucent object, really traveling through the rim, the actual translucent rim of the object. It's no longer a perspective trick with the camera. Um, it's, it's, the light is actually happening because of a subsurface scattering. Um, I get you. Uh, okay. Uh, you can just watch the video of what you miss when it goes up. <clears throat> oh, okay. So, um, I'm gonna just show you a quick before and after, and then we'll move on to the faces, or, uh, whatever it is that I chose. So, before, after. Please learn how to shade radially. Please start doing some form studies. It will really benefit the way you draw. It removes the creative process. It boils out all that other business, and it leaves just behind just just leaves behind the sciences that you need in order to become a better artist. And the way you capture the sciences in your canvas. All right. <clears throat> some digital artists say they use rim light to bring out form. Of course, rim light is secondary rim secondary light source is what brings out the form that might be blanketed with too much shadow. So if there's a, an area that is super shadowed and all you can really do, you know what, there's a reason why I have Portrait Studio. So what this does, it's not really rim light anymore, but you can call it that if it makes it easier to imagine. But let's say this is just a really, really beautiful, uh, kind of like a butterfly cast shadow happening on the face. We turn on the secondary light source, dim it, it can't be as strong and move this. Sorry, it's just rendering. I have a super high quality version of Portrait Studio that I can run on a computer, but it's not the one we released. And what it's doing here is because there's so much of that shadow that is blocking the form just around her face, we can cancel some of that shadow out, even raise that brightness all the way up, give it a color, just so that we can <clears throat> release or relieve some of the shadow that's 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 uh, so relieve some of the form that is being flooded by that shadow. We can do it on both accounts. Another light source with a smaller di lower dimness, a different color. Ew. Okay, and at a at an equal area away just so that we can see some relief happen. But this is no longer rim light, this is secondary light source. This is diffusing the primary light source. This is diffusing the core shadow. It's not really called rim light anymore. All right. <clears throat> oh, ring light. Oh yes, ring lights are just constantly throwing lights from all that different directions, which is the same thing, Sarah. Sarah. It, it, uh, it cancels out major shadows. So having a light here, light here, light here, light here, all the way around cancels out shadows from every direction so only your face is visible and the light hits your nose directly that way your nose isn't casting that massive a shadow <clears throat> all right all right so any questions uh... <laughs> Um, I think subsurface scattering and rim lighting are two different things. Um, H.G. Williams, I know that they are two separate things, but in the case of rim lighting, how they happen, 
subsurface scattering happens along the surface and a little bit below the surface of an object that has a translucency to it. And if the camera is placed at a certain angle, that subsurface scattering will cause that rim light to happen because we are at the angle where we are seeing the silhouette and the object is, is in front of the light source. That's what I mean by subsurface scattering and rim lighting are happening at the same time or because or in cause of each other, in reaction to each other. Both happen at the same time. All right, so there's that. Um, if any more questions, please ask them the next time we discuss this or ask them in the community. But I'm going to go ahead and jump into the into the paint over. So mini lesson, please, please try as much as possible to uh, to to paint uh, or try to uh, put a put like some sort of a background noise, uh, some just cancel out all the creative creative. Uh, you're expecting yourself to be creative, cancel all that noise out and just put only the no thinking involved in form studies. Basically stop thinking and just jump into your form studies. Um, what is this? Ugh. <laughs> I think there was a bunch of flour on my shoulder. Um, okay. I know this is off topic, but can these lessons help me in less realistic drawings? Um, less realistic means you have a line dependency. It means you're shading, cell shading, like you're trying a cell shading, which is from more working towards a gradient than working radially. Um, so I'm not sure they can help you. Form studies can help you figure out, you know, even if, if you're painting with lines, you still have to draw a proportionate face. So that might help you develop a more believable skull and outline a more believable skull and all of that. But uh, other than that, I think uh, it sounds the, like the lesson is learn the rules before creatively breaking them. You can still be as creative as you want to be, but the point is some of these rules will never be broken, H.G. Williams. Uh, because the, these rules are, are continuous, they're timeless, they're, they are the physics of our world. It's not that these rules, these rules, physics is not a cap on your creativity. It's an enhancement to make your creativity more believable. Write that back to me. It's not a way to turn off your creativity. You can still have a creativity involved and use your physics at the same time. But when you want to efficiently study and improve as fast as possible, if there's this pressure to be creative with everything that you make, including your studies and sketches, at that point you won't improve as fast as you want to. So if you want to learn how to shade better, learn how to do better lighting in your paintings or create better lighting, um, if you want to know how to detail, if you want to know how to create edge work, all of that stuff, it, you can be, you can do it off hours, off creative hours, behind the scenes, and just you know ha set up a comfortable uh, dashboard and just get in and just sculpt, just for the sake of sculpting, just for the sake of the sciences. <clears throat> yes, I mean if you're if you're shading, if you're trying to invent some sort of beautiful character, and you, the shading is all wrong and the hair color matches doesn't match the skin and the background looks all weird and wonky. I believe that this, I don't believe that this character is real. But if there's this crazy shading happening and the physics are on point, I can't help but imagine that this is a screenshot or a, a photograph of some real event that happened somewhere in another dimension. <clears throat> Alright, so let's talk about this fella here. Um, well, the biggest problem here is, is the color choices. He's a, some sort of a zombie. If he's not a zombie, he's a cyborg being unwrapped. Um, I think he's a zombie because of the skeleton. There isn't a real indication that what's under here is metallic. Uh, at that point you would be excused of the fact that you've used flesh tone colors um, uh, because it's a metallic like a wrap. Uh, so um, what happens now is that we have to show that this is a rotting that's happening or a an injury or something like that and having these flesh tones is just simply not what you do. I'm gonna go straight into the hue saturation, just control U and just desaturate this and run it towards the greens. Just this alone has made him feel like he really is dying. Uh, so before, after, just that alone. And um, this comes just, for, just by knowing how to paint skin. If you know that in order to paint skin, or if you've painted enough skin that you know that if I use this kind of green here, 
it just will make the face look dead. Let me try using a more saturated color. So if you've done those kinds of studies and you know a saturated color gives you a believable flesh tone, why would you use that flesh tone that you know gives you a, a live looking person if, you're, if, you're, if your intention is to paint something that looks dead or that is deteriorating or that is dying? <clears throat> Another thing that I would, I think that you did great here, throwing the red into his eyes because that blood kind of just poked through and the white of his eyes really, um, well, it just looks sick. Another thing that you want to do for, remember there's this distinction between the villain and the monster. Uh, the villain and the monster are just, they're not, you can't really mix the two together. Um, you can't give the monster some idea uh, or some, some consciousness and then, uh, how do I say this? The villain has a consciousness, a real consciousness behind them, which is why we bring in the skull to remove the life from them, because they are the villain. They've committed evils in the story that we're designing. The monster can be all kinds of hideous, can be an actual skeleton. Um, you have, have used actual skeletons in games like Skyrim, I think, and uh, Dark Souls. They're actually, you're actually fighting a monster skeleton, but that monster skeleton, honestly, I don't think he's a villain. He's just a bad guy or a a minion that I have to get rid of. So you have to ask yourself, this character right now that I'm designing, is he a minion? Or is he a villain? If he's a villain, you have to put a lot more work into his eyes. You have to put a lot more work into his expression. He's, he's reading as a villain, like some sort of man that wants retribution, or, or some someone that is that had a life before and he's unfortunate enough to remember it. And now he's out to cause all kinds of mess. And a really good example of this is Harvey Dent's face. His face was just torn up. He looked like a monster. He was a monster, but he was successfully he was successfully read as a villain because of the way he was designed. He had a consciousness. He had a story behind him and a lot of expression. Very expressive face. Even more so exaggerated because he only had half the face. So eyebrows had to be extra high or extra low. And you had that extra villain eyebrow going on. And it was a lot of work went into making his face more believable. So there's a lot of design power behind or design expectancy behind you as a designer. To be able to pull off this convincing um, dead look. So I'm going to get rid of some of that purple. It's really distracting. I want to get down the basic skin tone first, perfect that before I jump into some rim lights or, or whatever these were. And you want to make it as patchy as possible. Capillaries probably exploded, veins are probably dying and rotting, actual actual mold or, or some kind of uh, puss or something like that sitting around the eye, some, some sort of bile colors. Just think gross insides. You know, Those are the colors that really make everything kind of pop. So the inner corners of his eyes, bloodshot eyes, maybe one eye would be red. All of these things help push the fact that he's dying. He looked really pretty. He looked like the, um, what's his name, Edward Cullen of the zombie story, of the zombie world. Like a really handsome looking zombie. So just throw in some more design um, liberty in there. Let me just blur that, make it a little bit more sickly looking. And you want to get rid of that uh, that shine in his skin, but you also want to bring it in, in areas where it doesn't belong. So just around here, maybe around the eyes, an extra shine, uh, super extra shine around the nose. Maybe that the body's releasing its, you know, it's a dying person, but it's still sentient. So maybe a couple more, you know, jumps up on the specular limit. Throwing some more of that. Patchy, patchy stuff. So getting the green where green doesn't belong. So on the cheeks, usually we just throw a bunch of um, blush there to, to signify life. And I'm just going to throw a bunch of green around his mouth, around the tips of his nose that are rotting quicker, getting more sunlight. And just around where the flesh starts to just uh, become visible, that's where I'm going to throw the reds in. And that's what will really make that gore factor happen, is that we're preserving the reds for anywhere where skin is actually peeling, where the gore happens. And the surface area and the skin is just rotting. 
This exact same technique for makeup, uh, when, they're, when they're doing special effects makeup or something like that. That red is so preserved, it's saved for last. And everything else is just setting up the plate or the base. <clears throat> All right, you can throw in some random colors like blues just around certain areas. No colors we shouldn't be seeing. Maybe one of his eyes is the original color. Um, but I'll leave that to you. <clears throat> so before, whoops. Before after you see how saturated he was? He really didn't feel like he was dying. Um, I would spike that highlight all the way up. Just dodge tool on mid-tones. Just throw in some highlights where the light hits. Okay. I do recommend you kind of just move this from straight at the top. Uh, it kind of looks like a monk to me. I just feel like you had all the all like, so many areas where you could have thrown that patch of no hair, but you chose the hair, you know, balding, the exact area where balding happens. I just feel like it's not random; it's just deliberate. And monks actually did shave the tops of their heads like that. Again, deliberate. So it feels like a deliberate, you know, nature is being really deliberate with this guy and just making him um, bald in the exact spot where you naturally would. And that kind of is distracting to me. As the viewer, I just feel like, why of all places does he? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extend it to be like half his head. And he'll feel, feel less like a monk. Also, you've got purple happen in there, so you might want to fix that too. Make it a pale white, just a pale yellowy white for the, for the bone that has probably been sitting under the sun a while. It probably dried up. Sorry about the gore. So think about referencing. Try to pull up a reference of you know how zombies were painted. A villain. Is it a villain or is it just a simple monster? Okay. I'm sorry I'm not looking at the comments. I will in a moment. Just saturating that. Giving it a nice spike in the highlights. And then throwing down some yellows and reds real quick. I'm just going to pull from the face. Excuse me. <laughs> Damn it, I was trying to fight it. And it just happened. Gosh dang it. It was a hiccup. Alright, that's all it was. Okay. Oh, no. Before. After. Uh, the bald spot bothered me too. Yeah, it just feels like it was a deliberate instead of a, a you know, an, a kind of nature deterioration kind of thing. So let's see what everyone's saying. Sirac is a magician. Thank you. <clears throat> what is the recommended medium to work with if you want to practice these things if you don't have access to digital painting? A really uh, non, I guess, non-invasive coloring style, so definitely not, not paints. Um, uh, colored pencils, yeah, I absolutely agree with everyone. Colored pencils is just the best thing to do right now. In one video of coloring realistic skin, Ista said that we can't use purple for the skin. I hope I'm right, so is it wrong here or no? Uh, purple on the skin can be used, but it has to be accessed through red. You can't just bring in a purple and just smack it there. So if that's why you use the purple for the shadows, this is wrong. Uh, you need to desaturate it, give desaturation a chance. This was just too much purple. It looked like it was an actual purple sitting on the skin instead of the color theory um, uh, reaction. <clears throat> so I think you should desaturate first and then uh, see if you can bring in the red purple and throw it on there. If you're painting lively skin, this is dying skin. That uh, Go desaturation before you go purple. Okay. Are those ears a bit small? Um, I wouldn't complain about the ears too much. I might pull them down just a little bit, but looking at where his nose is, I think that's just how his face is. 
But you can pull them down if you if you see that they are a bit small. You believe in Harvey Dent. <laughs> Yes, when I watch one of your hour-long videos on the science of skin and lighting, I improved so much in just days, and it did add more life to my drawings. Yeah, awesome. You just have to think of it in layers. The blood, the skin being having its own color, and then the light on the skin and on the blood. When you're having someone that's dying, you really can't use any of those rules. He just has to look like he's dying. Ask it again. All right, so before... After getting rid of the lines, I would make the background a little bit lighter. He seems like he's out in the day, uh, but it's already so light. So those are my suggestions for this piece. Uh, this one I'll talk about in a second, but I just wanted to talk about this cloud piece. I think the person asked me about depth or something like that. Um, there isn't enough of a distance, I think, between this object and this object to create a massive atmospheric fade. You can still use it if you want. I, but I don't think that's what the issue is here. I mean, you can desaturate to make it feel like this is far away. So I'm just desaturating. All right. That'll make it feel like it's further away. That just that one thing. You don't get as much light uh, as you do before. It was the one about the purple and the skin. You already answered it. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I thought it was further up than that. You can do that. You can smack that in there. You, you, you really can't saturate and atmospheric fade. You have to make sure you're desaturated. It looks really off. But in saying that, furthermore, um, I think that... Yeah, it is annoying. It is pretty annoying. Um, right here. All of these pretty much have the same kind of width to them. So, this one here. And what's happened, it's made, I mean, all these clouds now look like that faces. Um, but <laughs> unimpressed clouds. Uh, but what's happened here is that they've repeated the same old texture. It's starting to look like a blanket texture, really, than clouds. So what we want to do with clouds, we want to break up these pieces. Um, make sure that with every piece we paint, we break it up into two or three more pieces. Um, yeah, I, I, I closed it. Sorry, a server was open. Was I lagging? The stream went down? Okay. Is it up now? Right, can you guys hear me? Oh, it went down. What program? <laughs> John, get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> she might be catching her breath. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Pixie. No, no, I'm, I'm good now. Okay, so what you, we want to do is we want to break these pieces up. Wherever we found that repeating shape, that repeating length, we just want to break it up into a smaller. As for the brush you used, as for the clouds themselves, the color of the sky behind, all of these areas are still a little bit um, boring. They're not really, they don't really feel like clouds. And I gotta tell you, clouds are scary, clouds are difficult, clouds are not easy to paint. Um, they have this amazing, really, really high value to them, and a lot of it goes into edge work. So if you can't, don't know how to keep an edge, you don't know how to formulate an edge, take it into a form study. Make form studies out of clouds, and that's possible. Yes, it's not a cube, but you can still do a form study out of it. Um, and uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm happy it's back up. I think it was a server I was running, and that's what made it happen. But <clears throat> when you do a form study of clouds, I recommend that you start with a gray background that's pretty light. The sky is always pretty light um, around clouds. And what we want to do, let me just darken it just a little bit. Oh, no. Okay, and what we want to do is with our lasso, we want to just um, just draw the cloud shape, right? So that's kind of like a cumulonimbus or whatever it's called. Get a slightly darker shade, and this is how dark we'll go. We won't go any darker than this. And once you remove that, start shading the larger pieces one by one. So shade them in their in their in their size, and always think about where the light source is coming from. 
Okay, so if the light source is coming from this side, then a lot of that light will lean on one side, and that's not how dark will go. We'll go a little bit darker, and we'll just <clears throat> shade these pieces as we go. Eventually, we'll break these pieces down. They'll get shorter, smaller, more com compact with different cloud patterns. But essentially, this is what a cloud is. It's still a form structure. Maybe this piece here is casting a shadow on this side, and this side gets just a little bit of light through. This is starting to look like a cloud. And this is how you're supposed to start a cloud. You can uh, disconnect from the from the lasso and go ahead and smudge the edges if you need to. Add in some more edges, but essentially what you're supposed to be doing is thinking of them as a form, as a real form that might get, you know, get in the way of light and cast its own shadows. And yes, clouds cast shadows. Now all you have to do is shrink your brush and start making some of those edges happen. So this little bit here is in front of this little bit, and this little bit here is broken up into a couple other clouds, and they start off with that, like a gradient, and they move up, and guess what? They shade radially. The bits at the top get more light. Whoa. Okay. They just get lighter and lighter near the tops. Some sharper cast shadows, maybe. <clears throat> just like that, just casting through. That's what I recommend you guys do. Take take them into form studies. Look at this. There's no creative force or creative uh, pressure. I'm just drawing a cloud just, just to have fun. Just messing around with some cloud shapes. Okay. So this is exactly what I want you guys to do. Think about where the light is coming from and... Uh, cast the major molar shadows that emerge from the geometry. Make sure you're building dark dark to light always or mid-tone to dark and mid-tone to light. Uh, but all of that really is what you're supposed to be doing in your painting. You, you carry that organized process back towards your painting so you don't really um, draw these repetitive shapes in your clouds anymore. All right. Also working with a reference is really important. Making sure the background is light enough is also really really important. But, uh, yes. Uh, Micah Fliff asks me on Facebook, he asked me a couple times, he, uh, he said, <clears throat> Hi, I was wondering, how do you quickly change to a lighter, darker tone on Photoshop without going into your color picker? I think you're talking about the dodge tool and the burn tool. Uh, it's just a, a couple of, uh, two tools, and really what they do is they either burn on mid-tones and shadows, they behave very differently on these settings. Or, uh, or the, the burn tool, and this is the dodge tool that highlights, um, again, on different settings, mid-tone highlights or shadows. Uh, what else did you ask? Uh, is there a keyboard shortcut for it? I think it's O. How do you get the color looking so smooth? I blend with a soft brush on low opacity with transfer and pen pressure turned on. I don't know if I have the wrong setting, but when I try to paint every time I press down on the pen tip, it puts a darker shade on top instead of the same shade, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what that means. It doesn't make sense. If you could even do a setting tutorial on how to use the brushes you just released, it would help a lot. The settings on the brushes have already been pre-made. Uh, there's no other settings I would change on those. They're kind of perfected. And um, when I blend with these, is really just making sure I have a base tone. Oh, I love this brush so much. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, making sure I have a base tone and then um, and then throwing the lighter shades on top. And because I have transfer on, I'm already getting the next shade for me. And all I have to do is press harder. I won't get a larger shape. This is just one of them. But I already have three tones just by pressing lighter. So that's how I can blend much easier, just like that. And I can blend the sides together and I get that painterly that painterly effect. Um, as for soft brush, this is what gives you that complete smoothness. And when you have pen pressure turned on on soft brush and you're pretty dark and you got a large brush, you do get a smaller size. Like let me turn off you know, pen pressure, opacity, I mean all the way low. And you do stuff like this, you will get the small dots that pop up out of nowhere. And that's because you're pressing really light if you have pen pressure on. If you turn pen pressure off, you don't ever get that. You just get the same size, but you do get a slightly lighter 
shade if you press lighter and if you press really hard you get the full shade but that was on 44 percent so lighter on 100 and darker on 100 and this is just because I turned off transfer even with smoothing turned off it'll still do this lighter and then really hard 100 percent opacity mess around with your settings make sure that you are familiar with Photoshop settings don't don't uh, you know ask about settings and not attempt them yourself make sure you ha you understand what each setting does for your specific kind of brush stroke um, all kinds of brushes behave very differently with transfer um, this is why I turned pen pressure off for some of these brushes here because they're just they need to stay thicker so this one here I love it, it really behaves like a like an oil brush especially because it I call them the dry oil and it's really what they are it's like painting with dry brush technique and all you have to do is layer them to get that technique to happen but I don't have pen pressure on if I did turn pen pressure on if I did do the size jitter the minimum space like the sorry where is that shit where is it <clears throat> no right here if I turn this all the way down then I'd get this shape and I don't want this shape I want like the full size that way it really feels like a traditional brush. Again, you just have to look through your the settings yourself and make sure that you're experimenting with what kind of brush you want to use consistently for your studies. Um, and, uh, and you'll learn how to blend there. That's how I get it. So smooth it's the soft brush. I wouldn't be able if I sat here till I was blue in the face using a textured brush to get the same kind of blendability as soft brush. Simply not going to happen. Soft brush has a feathered edge. It already blends with the first stroke that you lay down. That's just what soft brush is. And this is at 100% opacity. All right, you need to learn also your hand weight. Practice your hand weight. What, what kind of, you know, what's the weight in your hand when you're drawing? Are you a very, do you hold your pen very hard? Is it a very heavy stroke that you're used to? You just have to get used to your own work. So this will never be like this. You have to know that I use a soft brush when I blend this well, not my traditional brushes that I, that I just released. <clears throat> okay, where did I leave off? All right, any questions? Um, let me just scroll up for an answer, but any more questions? Um, okay, good. Also, do you guys know if Mr. Brack has any videos on how to use brushes and tools effectively? They're, they're scattered, uh, embedded in all my tutorials. I don't have one dedicated to them. I do have uh, a video on how to blend, which is where I talk about my brushes. Um, very, it's a very recent video. Um, uh, does anyone have any tips on working with gouache? Layer it. Go light, lighter and, and go into darker. Just layer your gouache. Um, okay, any more questions? Sorry you had to wait so long, um, Mikey Fluff, Mikey Fliff. If that was your question, I'm not even sure if that was your question. I hope it was. <clears throat> Is it bad that I only use soft brush? No, it isn't, Oliver. But I do recommend that you guys use your soft brush um, in a way where you still have edge work, you know, still have the edges happen. Uh, in your in your images. So make, for this person, just a final verdict, please make sure that you're breaking up these clouds into parts and study clouds all together. I think that was the most problematic thing about this painting. It wasn't really this, the distance um, or the depth of the further ducks. <clears throat> for this person here, I think it's more of a design, a character design issue. He feels very old, um, which is because mostly because of the distance between his mouth and his nose. That's caused a lot of age to happen. This shadow right here added age. The downturned eyes added age. Um, one second, please. The hairless eyebrows added age. The deep set cheekbones added age. So I think what was really missing for this character, and it might just work, is just giving him a little bit of a hunch or haunch, haunch. I think that's what it's called. Like a hunch in the back or hunch, hunched back, hunchback, hunch. I don't know. But let's see what that does for us here. Okay. I think that's really just made it made him match. I'm just gonna cover his upper arm because it's not no longer proportionate. 
now that I added more space, but... Okay, so I think that's really what's done it for us here, is that he actually feels like he's old. At this point, it just looks like a really, really young kid with an unbelievably aged face. You know how there's some people that are so young, but they, they just have that old face? Um, that's what it looks like because he's so, so skinny. But when we add that, I feel like we're adding to the age. We're continuing the theme of that character, the age of that character. Uh, as I said before, don't mix age groups. It creates for an uncanny character. Um, it was in my recent videos. Don't mix age groups and don't mix genders. Can anyone explain why we can't do that? Why can't we mix age groups and genders and character design? <coughs> Okay, so I'm just gonna wait. Um, <laughs> some of the stuff I can't say <laughs> your comments, but yes, do that thing that Tiv said to do. For the love of Pete. I wish there was a way where I could uh, source that download for you guys, so whoever needed it would be able to download it. Proportion. Proportion is, a, is an amazing uh, reason why we can't mix genders and we can't mix age groups in character design. The nose could be longer to add age, right? Yeah, it could be longer, it could be more hooked as well to add the age. Um, because it becomes really random, like the picture doesn't have a goal. Yeah, which mean, which, which basically is what you're trying to say is you mix the themes together. What are you really trying to say? Is it an old person or is it a young? What, what does the character, is there a read? Um, they should be able to read like, I can't snap with my left. They should be able to read like that um, uh, on the screen so that the audience member officially, initially sees, okay, this is a, an old person or young person, antagonist or protagonist. <clears throat> makes the picture less believable. Yeah, because that doesn't really happen as often in real life. Androgyny is very rare, as much as Tumblr likes to argue against that. Androgyny is very rare. I think an andro androgynous character doesn't make for good uh, storytelling, unless you're deliberately trying to make everyone confused about whether or not they're girls or boys. I don't know why you would do that to your audience members. Um, but yeah, anime does that a lot. Uh, does gender ambiguous count as mixing genders? Yes, it does. <clears throat> Painting a consist consistently being incapable of differentiating between major me female and major mer male signifiers, char character signifiers, the signatures between male and female in your work doesn't show as doesn't light up as a strength in your art, lights up as a weakness in your art. You can't draw a guy, or you can't draw a girl. That that shows up in your portfolio as a weakness. It doesn't show up in your portfolio as a strength. Uh, what you have to do, yeah, you may have a taste for the androgynous face. Go ahead and, you know, have all the tastes you want to have. But when it comes to character design and getting hired for that, um, you really have to show that you are capable of creating a variety of characters. The old, burly, ogre, you know, axe-wielding, uh, what are they called? Lumberjacks, and then, the, the, you know, the feminine, um, or the feminine um, uh, fairy queen princess of the fairylands. If you can, if you have that wide a scope, that wide a variety in your design power, it will prove that you are that str that strong um, in your uh, in your creative process. That made no sense, but who cares? Uh, shoulders don't reflect the pose of the head. Uh, or could that be on purpose? Yes, I already uh, addressed that, Oreo. Uh, we have to add in the uh, the hunch in the back, and then replace completely, remove the arms, and place them somewhere up here. Um, maybe that'll just give the body a little bit more believability. That way we're not mixing age and gender. I mean, he's not really messing around with the gender. He definitely feels like a male. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah. I thought Haku was a guy. Um, I think the same for the rules. Need to know them in order to break them. Yes, yeah, same for genders. You need to be able to create a male and female, then try to break the barriers. Exactly. Unless, you know, if, if, a, if a character really calls on it, then do it. But unless you really have to, you really shouldn't be mixing genders all around, all day, every day in your work. <clears throat> um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. 
Welcome, Oreo. It's okay if you're late. Welcome, anyway. It's nice to see you around. <clears throat> okay, so I think that's it for today. But please, please, all 100 of you, please go to the community and remember that you need to vote for the next theme. Alright, so it's really important that you guys vote. If there aren't enough votes, I won't be able to host the, the, the theme change. The themes are environments. The Titan's Graveyard seems to be winning. So painting an environment, I'll give you the specifics in the resource pack, but basically, basically it'll be like an alien environment and all the great titans fell or there was a great battle at one point thousands of years ago and only parts of their bodies remain. I think one of these amazing um, concepts was made in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy Nowhere. I think that's what it was called. Oh my god, it's so beautiful because it was the, the, the leftovers of a, of a dead titan, uh, of a dead something, and they were fighting and this is just the remainder of his head and they were like farming it for biofuel or bio parts or whatever, but just something that around these lines, but it would actually be a flat landscape because this is, um, this needs to be, well, we're going to be talking about perspective a lot, but this is just one of those amazing, amazing scenes in, in this movie. Uh, when I saw it, I was just like, oh my god, tell me more. It was so beautiful. <clears throat> just the way they introduced it and talked about it. Character design, the chemist. Um, it can be all kinds of themes applied to this. I will give you a resource pack what to work with. What kind of chemist? What's their role? Is it like a pyromaniac or some sort of healer? Uh, but uh, but this is, yeah, another really cool character design concept. Character design, robot and cyborg or mech. Uh, this is something that we haven't tested a lot in the past or tried something new. A lot of us don't really have uh, familiarity with mechanical design. So this might help us. I'll be able to link you to some amazing Robert, um, what's this, Scott Robertson videos. Um, he's just the, he's the king of mechanical design. He's the king of art, really. Uh, prop design, swords, guns, items. Um, also another really cool way to dress up your portfolio. Um, so please remember to vote. Please, please, please remember to vote. <laughs> oh, you guys are adorable. Um, but yeah, if you want to know what I'm doing here, if you're new, you've never been here before, um, just go to my website, isteract.com, and you'll be able to get a link, direct link to the community here. Facebook, if you want the stuff that I've painted over, if you want your copies back. Uh, Twitter, if you want to stay connected to me, uh, you, I just post everything on Twitter, every change, every cancellation, every delay, um, every video that ever goes up, it just goes straight up uh, on Twitter as well, or announced through Twitter. Um, there's my Instagram if you guys are interested in following me there, but um, just, you know, I just post my sketches and my work there to keep myself accountable for my New Year's resolutions. <clears throat> the Google community is right here, probably been linked a thousand times already. Uh, Facebook is right here. And uh, YouTube, please subscribe, please like, um, <laughs> you know, all that funny shit. Uh, yeah. I did six push ups on my knees today. My arms hurt a bit. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I'm so short of breath. Um, any questions before I get that you don't do it every time if you want to do a oh boy? You can do it if your goal is to make a hermaphrodite or a ha it has a purpose. That's better if you wish to draw a Yeah. Having purpose is always a great thing to have. <laughs> By the way, loving the brushes. Thank you. I love those brushes too. I painted um, my two latest images with it. So this one and this one. And it's really about edge control. They promote a lot of edge control because they are um, built around that dry brush technique in oil. Uh, which is basically just making sure that your paintbrush isn't fully wet so you don't get a lot of uh, feed on the paint, but it's also really dry. So not a full paintbrush and a dry paintbrush. So you didn't dip it in any water, you just went straight in for the color that you mixed. It's an amazing technique that gets you that nice glow, that textured glow, which is what all those brushes, um, you know, what they're about. So if you're interested in the brushes, actually, just go to the website. Um, and go to the store. On the store you can find the brushes, PayPal or credit card, and uh, Portrait Studio, information about Portrait Studio, which is the program I use today. By the way, amazing updates of Portrait Studio, a full body is coming up. Full body Portrait Studio, posable full body, posable hand, 
Um, completely new models for male and female. Completely new UI. So all of you who've bought it already, you bought it at like half the price it's going to be. Uh, the price is going to go up um, after this. And uh, it probably will stay beneath $80 or stay definitely beneath $100, uh, which is way too much, I think, to, to ask us students nowadays. But um, yeah, I'll price it fairly, I promise you. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.